quantum, when I think of quantum annealing, I'm always thinking of a couple of things. I'm thinking of practical applications, like a quick and dirty approach to solve combinatorial optimization problems. I'm thinking as well, in the framework on Ishimori, actually, it wasn't at finite temperature, actually, it was a zero temperature. But usually, as it is understood now, I'm thinking of a device at, 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 a, temp at a temperature of a fridge. So, a divided quantum computation is just really coherent, zero temperature computation. So, it's basically, it's just, uh, you don't get any temperature, it's just basically, you just do computation, and that's completely equivalent to the gate-based model. So, that's why a divided quantum computation is very important, just because it's, uh, a, it's equivalent the same way that one-way computing, and many of these paradigms, uh, topological computing, adiabatic is equivalent to gate-based as well. So, this is basically the paper of Farhi, uh, but in reality, it looks like he wasn't aware of the paper of, uh, or, or at least there is no reference to the paper of Idetochi uh, back then in, in, in the day. Now, what is actually, what is the magic? That's what we're gonna do in the, in the blackboard for a little while. Let's see if we can swap here. Okay, so basically, what really does the magic in, uh, in quantum annealing is what we know as the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics. I'm not gonna go, of course, in 20 minutes or 10 minutes into the whole detail of the derivation and all of that, but just to give you a flavor of why is it called adiabatic quantum computation. It's because it relies on the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics. And basically, what the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics is, it tells you is, usually in, in, in adiabatic quantum computation, we're actually dealing with something that is not the common thing that we do in undergraduate courses, that is actually dealing usually with time-dependent Hamiltonians. But now maybe if we deal with more time-dependent uh, Hamiltonians, but uh, basically, let's assume that we have a Hamiltonian. Let's assume that we have a Hamiltonian that actually is time dependent. And then let's just define the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, the instantaneous eigenstate of the Hamiltonian as this. So that's basically the instantaneous spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Since it is changing in time, so the spectrum is gonna be different at every single time. So basically, I mean, if you work in this basis, uh, another thing, I mean, for example, is any wave function at any time, you can expand it in that basis, because it's a complete basis. And that's part actually of the, of the proof. Basically, just to give you an idea, let's assume for a moment that you start at point A, you start at point A with a wave function at time zero that is actually happens to be the ground state at time zero. What the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics is telling you is that if you do what is called an adiabatic path, adiabatic evolution, basically what would happen is that, so let me put this as time zero, and this is my time, for a certain time, t run, I'm gonna put it t run because I'm gonna associate this with an algorithm. If I do this, and if I do this adiabatically, and the question of what does it mean to be adiabatically, actually there are many definitions, but in principle, let's take it for the moment just slow enough, there is a principle exactly that relates to the gap of the quantum system. There are many, many criteria. Ask me that over the break. But I think in principle, there are some criteria that decides how slow you need to go in order to satisfy more or less this condition. That the wave function at time t equals at the end of the calculation or at the end of the process, when you are actually driving the system with h of t, it actually happens to be, again, the ground state, but now the ground state associated with the final Hamiltonian. 
So the Hamiltonian is changing, and basically you're staying in the ground state throughout. That's an adiabatic process, what we know. And the adiabatic theorem is just a proof, um, and the adiabatic condition, it just tells you how slow you need to move for that to happen. So I'm gonna put it actually as an approximation, because there are usually, this is just an approximation. So now, how can you use this for computation? Actually, that's the, that's the key idea behind uh, uh, Nishimori's paper, and then, then the paper by, by Finilla in 1994, is that suppose actually that you start at time zero, you start with a Hamiltonian, you prepare a ground state. By the way, the adiabatic theorem applies for any state n, not just the ground state, as long as there are no crossings in the, in the energy levels. So you start in n, you end up in n. If you start in the ground state, you follow the ground state, right? If, let's say that actually this state is easy to prepare for experimentalists. Maybe because it comes from a trivial Hamiltonian. That's good news, I mean, there are tons of those. One of those actually, let me call this for a moment H driver, or HD. So, I'll give you an example of that, is if I assume H driver to be, as you saw in the slide, sigma X, I, you know that the ground state is just the full superposition of all the states. And that's usually easy to prepare in a, in a, in a, in a, in a lab, either in, in a hardware or just in superconducting qubits. So this is a trivial Hamiltonian that you can prepare, and notice that it has the property that is sigma x. So the important properties of sigma x is because we want to have something that doesn't commute with the problem Hamiltonian, because otherwise we're gonna have crossings in the energy levels. Now, the idea is that if you do this, and you adiabatically prepare, adiabatically evolve, evolve, for example, following this path, let's just actually conjecture this path, h of t, or h of tau, let's put it tau, let's just say that this is one minus tau, h of d, so at time zero, tau is just t over t run, in such a way that tau goes between zero and one, I just, parameterizing tau, and then plus tau h of p. How can I do computation with this? Well, it's simple. I start with a trivial ground state of a non-Hamiltonian that I can easily prepare, is the sigma x Hamiltonian, and I start with a full superposition of all the two to the n states. And adiabatically, basically, if I, I start at time zero, and at time t, notice what's happening to the driver Hamiltonian. It's being turned off. It's been killed, killed, killed. And what is, Hamil what is the Hamiltonian at time equals one? It's identically the problem Hamiltonian. What this is telling you, that the magic that would happen is that you would end up, just by using that trick, you would end up in the ground state of the nasty Hamiltonian that you don't know the answer to. Or of the multidimensional potential energy surface that you're, not, you're trying to figure out what's the global optimum, if you had a continuous Hamiltonian. But that's the beauty, actually, it's very simple. That's basically how you can use the Debatic theorem to find the ground state of an unknown Hamiltonian. The rest of the story is just to plug in HP, your combinatorial optimization problem, and voila, you're done, pretty much. That's basically what, what you're doing. So the idea is that if you do this, basically as I said, at the end of the day, you're approximately at the ground state, or t run, or t, or t, equals, or t equals one, for H of P, for the Hamiltonian that you don't know. And that's it. That's pretty much everything that, that goes into adiabatic quantum computation. So, of course, I mean, depending, if you're working on a many-body system and you're preparing the ground state, you just change AP. And then you work maybe with a different ground state Hamiltonian. There is a lot of, actually, for example, in one of my PhD articles, we were changing the design of the, alg the algorithm in such a way that maybe I don't want to start with a full position, position. Maybe I want to start with an initial guess. And actually, then you need to change the initial Hamiltonian, the driver, but basically it's the same, it's the same concept that would follow. So let's go back now to, to see some examples. Let's see if this works. Yeah, okay. So now we can go back, continue. And basically, as I told you, you start with the full superposition. If you assume that this is your x-axis, you are basically aligning all the spins 
in the plus direction, in the, we align with the x-axis, that will turn into a full superposition in the computational basis. The transfer field is fully blasted, is on. And then the, the longitudinal fields, they are associated with sigma c, they are turned off. And at the end of the schedule, hopefully you end up with a random configuration of, in the computational basis that actually coincides, hopefully, with a high probability being the ground state of your Hamiltonian. Of course, a lot of things happen actually when you go in that path, and actually you can escape from the ground state. There are many things that happen, and we will cover some of those. But basically, that's the principle. This is actually an experimental curve of how the amplitude A of t, that is just the amplitude of the driver, as you see, is, is large at the beginning and is turned off. And in the experiment, and also this is the type of course. So it's not as simple as a linear interpolation, but it gives you the flavor. Basically, it's the same concept. So this actually experimentally, usually these times are of the order in the new DWI devices, they are of the order of up to maybe five microseconds. In the past, I mean, when we did the experiment in 2012, it was 148 microseconds. So you can even play with the annealing time to make it even longer or, or smaller. And uh, basically, you're stretching this line. But you can basically have everything between tau. And just to give you a sense of the energy scales, that's going to be important when we talk about machine learning in the afternoon. Usually these devices have energy scales in the, in the order of gigahertz. That's actually kind of like give you an idea of the gap, basically, of the spacing between the energy levels. For the experimentalists, they like to see this. Uh, just to give you an idea of the actually how the device actually work, is basically the way these DWI devices work is you have an array of superconducting qubits. This is actually the layout. Basically, they have, they have these compound Joseph, Joseph junctions that they're just basically made of Naobium, so they're rings. But the rings really look mostly like, a, like, a, like, like bars, like stretch. But this is just one qubit, second qubit, third qubit, fourth qubit, fifth qubit, and the other ones across. So this is going to be very important for our uh, practical applications because basically, it's a hardware, it's a real world thing, so there are some limitations on how many qubits you can connect. And basically what this is telling you is that all that you are relying there with this type of architecture, and we're gonna see pictures of this. So the fact that you have the qubits, qubit two, so that you have this grid, that hopefully you, at least you can see the grid, qubit one, qubit two, qubit three, qubit four, five, six, seven, eight. This is basically one representation that we usually do is we have this as a bipartite graph. Because basically qubit one talks to all of these four, so the vertical qubits talk to the horizontal and vice versa. So it's basically it's like this. So it's a bipartite graph, reminiscent actually of the, of the RBMs. It's just a bipartite. These guys don't talk to each other, but they talk among themselves. So that's basically, that's, those are the restrictions that if you're solving a real world application, you need to take that into account because that's, that's life. I mean, it's, it's a physical device, you need to go around that. And so what that tells you actually is, for example, there are certain fluxes along these rings that will control the HIs, the biases. But there, are, there is another flux here that goes inside this little ring that actually controls the, the time dependence. Basically, it adjusts the strength of the driver Hamiltonian. And there is another flux that goes through this little small loop that actually controls the interaction between the two qubits. So there is a lot of engineering and manufacturing that you need to do to make this work. In such a way that we practitioners or scientists that we want to play with applications, at the end, the only thing that we need to give them is H's and J's, and they will do all the magic They're up there in setting the right pulses in such a way that whenever I specify an HI and a JIJ, this guy is programmed correctly, and this flux goes through this, through this wire in such a way that I get this Hamiltonian. So that's basically what is happening in a nutshell in these devices. There are two distinguishable states. The qubit itself, since it is a loop, we usually refer to a spin up. Let's say if the spin up would be this one, the red one, it would be the current is going counterclockwise. Or basically you can have a spin down, it would be the current going clockwise. And since it is a quantum system, basically you can have superposition of these currents. So here actually the two distinct they would be referred as different fluxes through the loop. And basically, that would be my spin down and my spin up. And these are actually the separation to the next levels that you don't take into account because we're dealing with qubits. So we only need to deal with this two level system, this one here and this one here. So when they measure, actually, when they do the readout, you will get either a spin down or a spin up. And it's very differentiable between 
flux, flux here or flux in this axis. So that's basically how the experiment works. But the important thing for you guys, if you're going to actually access one of these devices, is two, you can actually relatively easily set the H's and J's. But it's not, there's no free launch here, actually. You need to, not all the H's and JIJs, only the JIJs that you can program are the ones that actually are within this graph. So for example, qubit 1 and qubit 2, I don't have a JIJ. So you need to go around that, if you probably happen to have that JIJ. And there are many ways we can go around that. So I'm going to quickly actually walk you over a specific application and how you would do that. So here is actually an application in full diagnosis. In a nutshell, it's a multiplication circuit. And the idea is not to do the multiplication. The idea is if I give you the input and the, the, the input, the bit stream A and the bit stream B, and I want to multiply them, and I give you the output, and the output is wrong, what is going on in, in, the, in, in, the, in the circuit? So basically, which of the, all these gates is misbehaving in such a way that actually the outcome is not producing what you would expect? It's a combinatorial problem because you have many gates and many things could go wrong. Maybe it's this AND gate inside the electrical circuit and maybe it's this one, or maybe it's these three gates at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you a flavor of the Hamiltonian that you would end up, so I don't want you to memorize any of this in less than five minutes, but basically, just to give you a flavor of why you would get a Hamiltonian that is not just straight quadratic. Each one of these gates, for the most part, has two inputs and one output. And on top of that, you need to have a binary variable that describes whether the gate is faulty or not, because that's actually what you need to deliver to the engineer team, engineering team. You need to tell them gate number 15 is faulty. And then you need to have a zero and a one here that, tells, that, that controls that. The Hamiltonian actually is, is, is constructed in this way. Notice I'm using here Pubo, not Kubo. Pubo is because it's a higher than quadratic, it's polynomial, and it's actually this Hamiltonian happened to be quartic. And the reason for being quartic is because usually you're gonna have in the construction of the Hamiltonian interaction between the two inputs, one output and one gate. And that usually leads to multiplication of four terms. So you have a quartic many-body Hamiltonian there from start. So that, lo that looks like a huge problem. Actually, well, the, the problem consists of finding the assignment that explains the output, the wrong output, given the minimum number, minimum number of faults. So what's the most likable explanation in the number of faults that explains the output? So this is the minimization term that is very simple, is linear. But what makes the whole thing nasty is this actually is that you need to check that the output and the input con are, are consistent. So at the end of the day, as I told you, I mean, it's, 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 it's going to become a quartic Hamiltonian. How do we go around that? You can see actually a worked out example in this, uh, like a really a toy example in, in this paper, the first paper that we published of protein folding. That is an appendix where we show a simple technique where if you add this Hamiltonian term, so whenever we have quartic Hamiltonians like this one, you see, all of these guys are plus minus ones, like similar to our fault diagnosis. There is no way you can embed this at least in the D-Way device, these terms. You, need to, you want to map this Hamiltonian there. There's no way you can do that. The trick is actually to say, OK, I'm going to contract these two variables, Q1 and Q2, I'm going to call it Q5. And Q3 and Q4, I'm going to call it Q6. And now the term magically happened to be quadratic. But of course, I mean, it's not just that simple, because Q5 and Q6, they have their own their variables. They have their own life in their own. You need to have a way to control the fate of Q5 in such a way that it respects the truth table of Q1 and Q2. So for example, here is this Hamiltonian that you need to add on top after the contraction that has this form. So here is the contraction variable, and here are the two, Q1, Q2, Q5. Basically, this Hamiltonian enforces through a penalty that whenever Q1 is not Q1, Q2, the Q5 is not equivalent whenever Q5 is different from the product of Q1 and Q2, because that's what you use in your contraction, then it should penalize. They should, it should raise the penalty. Whenever Q1, Q5 is the product of Q1 and Q2, I'm, I'm fine. I can let it go. So basically what you see here from this truth table of this Hamiltonian, if you explore all the, all the eight values, it only penalizes, for example, if Q1 is 0 and Q2 is 0, 
it better be zero and it's not. They basically, boom, apply a penalty. And that's the way, actually, I can guarantee that although I'm adding variables to my register, I'm actually just going to, to, to I'm increasing the dimensionality. I'm still actually guaranteeing that the ground state is the one, is the, is one, that, one that makes sense. Why the penalty is larger for double zero giving one than There's double no one giving zero? There's okay. no reason really. I mean, it's just a construction, and I think maybe this is the only function that does this. <laughs> so I think it's, uh, I think actually this, this is coming from a paper in 1982. We are actually borrowing here in this paper. This stuff that was worked out in 1982, but I don't think there is a reason. Maybe this is the only function that does this. And, and the important thing is that you can apply a penalty and unfavor all of this in such a way that they, this is purest state that shouldn't be there. They are actually, they go up in the spectrum and then the, the ground state is preserved for all the possible valid assignments. So notice that actually in hardware, the implication of this is that the number of qubits grow. Because basically you are, you are measuring all of them. You're measuring Q5, you're measuring Q6 as well. But then basically you're measuring only instances. You can pre pretty much discard the Q5 and Q6 because they're not even part of the problem. But the, the thing that this is guaranteeing is that the ground state is preserved. So as I told you, this Hamiltonian, yes, it's true. You can get this cubic term just actually into a, in Q1, Q2 is Q5. You get a quadratic. And then you can take these quartic terms to a quadratic term. And the Hamiltonian is quadratic. And the beautiful thing is that this is quadratic. So in principle, we are done as long as we do this trick and we enhance the number of qubits. So that's the price that you pay off to reduce the locality. This is what we call the locality, the many body terms. The other thing that happened actually, once you have spin variables, this is a trivial transformation. You take this transformation and every single binary is 0, 1. If you want to represent this in a spin system, you, you do this simple transformation. This is basically the SI. And basically you can see that whenever S or the spin is, is minus 1, that would give you a 1. And whenever this is plus 1, this will give you a 0. So it basically is a simple transformation of variables. That's not, there's no sweat there. And at the end of the day, this is what we call the unembedded Hamiltonian. Quadratic, so it looks beautiful. Now it looks like something that is closer to, to what we can do in the hardware. But it's not. Because as you can see, the D wave itself here, there is not even, there is no way to encode even a, a simple graph like a triangle. So if you had a graph, there is no way. There is no three, the smallest cycle that you can find is a four, is a four cycle. So there is no even a, 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 a tricycle there. Cycle with three. So basically, here is when we play actually with a technique that we call embedding, that you need to add, then again, increase the number of qubits and replicate some of these variables in such a way that you can actually do the, uh, that you can actually have this variable. I'm going to actually do it for three because it's simple. <coughs> but basically, what you're doing is if you have variable one, two, and three, this basically, as I said, there is no way you can, there is no way in this graph that you can have everybody happy. So one can talk to two, okay, that's fine. One can talk to three, okay. But now two cannot talk to three. So there's no, there's no way. So basically what you do is you replicate three, you call it three prime, and then you add a very strong ferromagnetic coupler here in such a way that this is just one variable. And then you need to add another term to the Hamiltonian that I think it should be, uh, in this case, three, three prime. So for qubit four and qubit that is called now three prime, basically this qubit is gonna be just one, one qubit. I'm sorry. This should be S3, S3 prime. So basically, whenever they match, either they, they are both plus one or both minus one, this, uh, I'm gonna call this H ferromagnetic, and there is a penalty here. So basically, if these two, if these two values, they are ferromagnetic, they behave as one variable, then there is no penalty, this is zero. But if they are different, basically there is a penalty that I apply. So that's the way, I mean, would you deal with the connectivity issue in such a way that you can map it to something that actually looks like the hardware. For example, in this example of this complex graph, 
we needed to replicate QB2 and replicate QB4 in such a way that we can afford this connectivity. The number of resources that you need for a fully connected graph is quadratic. I think maybe, I think I'm running out of time, so it would be actually a couple of minutes, so I can finish this whole section. So here is, uh, here is actually the whole stages that you just learned. Every time that you want to have a real world problem, like a, a, a propositional logic circuit, you usually map it to a Hamiltonian that has quartic terms, polynomial, those are the hypergraphs here, cubic and quartic terms. Then you map that to something that looks more like quadratic. Then the next step, by play, paying the price of adding and sealing variables, those are my contraction terms. And then at the end of the day, you end up with something that you need to do the embedding trick to get it to the annealer. Actually, this is the graph of the one of the experiments on this small graph. So that's the way those are the steps. And you have to be very careful how you pick this uh, application because uh, the overheads could be huge depending on the type of graph that you end up with. And that's something that just with intuition you can, you can know. And this is just kind of like the resources in number of qubits when you go all the way from the number of gates in, this, in the circuit all the way to the number of variables that you will need in the device. Since I actually don't have time, uh, I mean, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on talking about this anyway, that's my last slide, is there are a lot of tons of details actually how to program this. Um, but just to kind of like to summarize, is that actually even that application that is the best one that we've seen to map to device, is it actually is a promising one for quantum computing? So in the finance side, I, I show you yes, the answer could be yes, I mean, it looks promising. Here actually this paper that looks like a high energy physics paper is actually is, uh, is one of the, the most fun collaboration I've done. I mean, I was leading this project for two years with people, as you can see from, from the, Sergey Isako was a student of, was a postdoc with Ma, uh, Matthias Troyer, he's now at Google, that's Harmut is here. So we needed actually to have ways to simulate the power of quantum annealing for quartic interactions and power of quantum annealing for this arbitrary connectivity because we don't have devices that do this. We have things that look like the D-Wave and we have simulators for this. But then basically we had to come up with extending the tools to actually to simulate the type of systems. Quartic Hamiltonians and all of that. So the other thing is we run experiments actually on the device and basically what we did is a scaling analysis similar to the finance that I show you with up to 700 qubits or so on the D-Wave device. device scaling the number of multipliers, where we show, where we at attack with all the tools that we can find, I mean, at least with simulated quantum annealing, we attack it actually with the, the best solvers. It just happens actually that the most famous uh, application for benchmarking competitions in full diagnosis is this, for, is this circuit for diagnosis. And Alex Feldman just happened to be 10 minutes away from, from NASA, and then basically he worked at Xerox Park. So he had the state-of-the-art solver for full diagnosis, so we could compare to classical solvers, and when he realized that Hedmut Katzraver, who is an expert in, co in combinatorial optimization in spin glass systems, was beating his code, he came up with a 2017 brand new code just for this Taylor application, and then that was beating everybody else, like a, sat, like a sat solver that he created. So basically, we needed to, we really wanted to be fair to the classical methods, and that's what we needed, the classical experts, we needed a classical experts in, in spin simulations, we needed to have, I mean, the whole, DW experiments, I mean, the, the whole basically, so that's the collaboration that I put together. I wanted to have from every single angle that we could uh, answer this question. And you can see the answer there, I think is, the short answer is, uh, without actually having, it, it significantly improves the performance and you can work with a device with arbitrary connectivity, that helps a lot, or at least with this graph. But basically, what you need actually, one of the most pressing things for experimental is actually is to increase the driver Hamiltonian. The driver Hamiltonian with the sigma x is very poor, actually. That's why Matthias Troyer can use his code, is because it's what is called a stochastic Hamiltonian. And Quantum Monte Carlo does a good job with it. There is no sign problem, pretty much, there. But if you go to sigma x, sigma x, if you, make, if you boost your driver Hamiltonian, then now we're, we're in business. But by now there is even universe. Quantum annealing would be universal quantum computation, then you can have more powerful driver Hamiltonian, you can have different effects. And that's basically what we show here is that definitely is a, is a big call for actually more sophisticated driver Hamiltonians if you want to have good results on real world applications. So that's, um, and this is basically for the afternoon. So, so thank you very much and that, let's go to lunch.
Any other question? So that everybody hates me because we can't go to lunch yet. <laughs> I, I just had a, uh, I was wondering if you, kn you probably know about uh, Yoshima Yamamoto's Ising machine at Stanford. Yes. How does that compare to quantum annealer? Is, is it? Yeah, actually, there, is, looks there, are, different. there are a couple of papers I sent you actually that they compare back to back the Dewey and the Yamamoto machine, actually the optical machines. Because I mean, uh, there was this science paper showing this all-to-all -all connectivity. But my understanding actually, and I think the authors usually agree with this, is that, again, it's, uh, maybe we, at dinner we were talking about this. It looks like it's a powerful machine. I don't think it's using quantum properties. It's more like the optical properties. So there is a lot of stuff that you can still do with classical, with classical computation, with optical modes. And, but it's, it's a very interesting setting. I think Fujitsu is actually working on that, uh, building a similar thing uh, to the optical, this optical set. It's very interesting. There is a there is a head-to-head -head comparison papers comparing these two these two proposals on the same type of graph. Um, I, I can send it to you. I think one of the authors should be my colleague. It was uh, David Venturelli, and I think there is Peter McMahon who was working in postdoc with Yamamoto. So I can I can look it up and maybe I find it. But I remember there was a comparison last year or this year. I'll send it to you. Questions? Um, so these D wave, like you have this uh, eight qubit cell and you have like uh, uh, restrictions to what you can do. Yeah. And like now you have many cells. So are there uh, two restrictions between the cells as well? Yes, so actually it's, uh, it's very simple, the, the graph. So we mentioned, and you can see it even here for the tiling for the picture, it's easier to see what's, what's going on. So actually the average connectivity is not four. It's actually, when you take into account the bulk, large unit cells, and usually you have 12 by 12, you have 1,000 qubits or 2,000 qubits. Basically what you have is this. So you have four by four here, and then basically the guys here on the left talk vertically above and below, so they have six. And the guys on the right, they talk to the left. I mean, here it's not needed, but for example, here you can see it. The one on the right here can talk to the one in the left. And the reason is because the reason, here is the picture, you can see here, if you had this grid, if you put it here in the middle, you can see here that the vertical ones can talk to the vertical ones below, and the horizontal ones can talk to only to the horizontal ones. So every qubit here is immersed kind of like uh, with neighbors. So it's a six degree graph. So it's a little bit better than four. The average, I mean, for a thousand devices, 5.6. That's actually, it just happened to be, I remember this number because as a coincidence, the, connect, connect, the average connectivity of this graph that is coming from the circuits happened to be actually the average connectivity of the D-way, that chimera graph. But it just, so that's to justify that it's a sparse graph in some way. But it's nice, it's a nice thing to have, sparse connectivity. So there are no requirements on the Hamiltonian and Hilbert space that allows you to pre to perform the adiabatic computation? Yes, as I said, so one has to be careful. So, uh, as I said, as long as there are no crossings in the, the energy levels, well, in crossings, I mean, there could be actually avoided crossings that happens all the time in, in quantum evolution, but literally kind of analytical crossings. So, for example, the paper that I was telling you that you need to initialize, you want to initialize with the initial guess, not the superposition. And then if I just connect the initial guess with the final Hamiltonian, guess what happens? If you have a Hamiltonian that is fully diagonal, it doesn't matter that you're starting the ground state of this Hamiltonian, the energy levels cross, and basically you follow, you stay in the same, it's a constant of motion, you stay there. You need to have the crossings and the, and the quantum fluctuations in order to have avoid the gaps. And as, and as long as you have that condition, then basically there is something that you can talk about. So that, that's one of the, care, you have to be careful in how you choose the, 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 the path in some way. But as long as you have this non-commutivity, for the most part you have, you, you don't have these pathological effects or real crossings. Uh, not avoiding crossing, but just really crossings. Uh, but actually then we would, we would just continue the path. Any more questions? So why all the organizers think if there is any announcement? Let, and before we thank Alejandro, let me just give my estimation that during this talk we had something like 11 questions from the organizers, two questions from another professor, one question from the students. More students. <laughs> I hope you, have, you perform better in the afternoon session, please. <laughs>
And okay, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you.